morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. What a privilege it is to be here to celebrate the ordinance of baptism, one of the ordinances of the, the Baptist local church. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is great to know that when a person gives their faith in Jesus Christ and the de shed blood of the Lord Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again, they put their faith in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago when he suffered and bled and died and someone repents of their sins or sorry for their sins and asks Jesus to forgive them. That Jesus says, if you'll call upon his name, you shall be saved. Today is our privilege to introduce you to candidate for baptism is Colton Cable. Colton is a brand new third grader. Colton has been on our most wanted list for about two years. And many of your children are on our most wanted list. And uh, for Colton, we, uh, we've been praying for him at least for two years by name, that he'd give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he went through summer camp at Horton Haven Christian Camp and had a, a great time talking to his camp teachers, many conversations about the Lord Jesus and what Jesus did for him as he died on the cross and was buried and rose again. But Colton was still considering the claims of Christ and the fact that he'd have to repent of his sins and turn to Jesus for forgiveness. Well, it wasn't until uh, he went home and talked to mom and dad, and then also uh, when he came to Vacation Bible School, uh, July the 7th through the 12th. And he met with his uh, Vacation Bible School counselor, Lee Cole. And for three nights, he went back and talked to Lee about his relationship with Jesus Christ. and. Uh, it was Wednesday, July 10th, 2019, with Lee Cole being there as one of his counselors, uh, Colton asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. Colton, is that true? Did you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Well, Colton, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in likeness of Jesus' death, Praise the likeness <laughs> of his resurrection. Amen. God bless you.
You give life, you are love. 
that we can touch base with you and come meet our pastor and deacon of the week at the table located out of the front left door in the worship center. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about a few events coming up soon. Today is our backpack outreach and tonight is our trademark concert. Today, volunteers need to report to the gym at 3.30. The outreach is from 4 to 6, followed by the concert at 6. This Wednesday night fellowship meal is lasagna with roasted potatoes, garlic bread, salad bar, and dessert. A sign-up sheet is located at the welcome desk. It is $5 a meal. Reservations may be made or canceled upon up to noon on Monday by calling the church office. A reservation will require payment. Link Fund team is sponsoring Playoff for the Payoff Trivia Night, August 10th, 2019 at 6 p.m. Form a team and play or just come for dinner and see which team takes home the trophy. Teams can be made of four people ages 10 and up. There will be door prizes and a silent auction as well. Ask any Building Fund team member for additional details. Tickets are for sale in the lobby following both services. Spectacular Sundays start next Sunday with our speaker, Bartholomew Orr, and worship leader, Thomas Smart. There will be a dessert fellowship for everyone after the service. There we go. Okay. Dalton does a great job, so let's give him a hand there. <laughs> Things do come up after we give him the announcements each week, and uh, let me just make a few in additional to that. Um, we, he mentioned that Spectacular Sunday starts next Sunday night. We uh, are going to be uh, enjoying the company of two sister churches, First Baptist Tullahoma and Mount Zion. Baptist Church, they're coming over because of Bartholomew Orr, and uh, First Baptist is coming because uh, their choir is joining our choir, and Tom's leading the music. We're going to have a dessert fellowship after that first spectacular Sunday, so we need you to help us out. We need uh, desserts, cookies, brownies, cupcakes, etc., for the dessert social after uh, the revival service, and uh, we'll provide the ice cream. Just bring those desserts that afternoon. Drop them off in the conference room that morning or that afternoon, and uh, we'll have ice cream to go with it and have a good old-fashioned fellowship with our brothers and sisters of other churches. We're expecting a house full, so we need a lot of good dessert. So, so bring some good Baptist desserts next week, okay? Uh, the Atlanta Braves trip, if you'll notice in there, we uh, are leaving next week, and I forgot about the time change, so we need to leave at 1 o'clock if you've signed up for the Atlanta Braves game instead of two o'clock uh, give ourselves an extra hour because of the time changing I do have four extra tickets available if you'll see me uh, those will be yours um, even if you can just take two of them or three of them but what I've got four extra tickets that uh, have come available so uh, see me afterwards if you receive the monthly offering envelopes you notice if you looked ahead there's an envelope that does not belong there this time I don't know if anybody's looked ahead, but it is for the Catholic Charities of Nashville. <laughs> a mistake was made from our envelope service, and they put the wrong envelope in the uh, Baptist bunch. And so uh, the, um, there's an envelope that says for Catholic Charities of Nashville. You can disregard that, or if you, the Lord lays on your heart, you can give to it. I don't care. Uh, just don't take your tithe and give it to them. But uh, that, that's the explanation for the envelope there as well. Um, I'm a Gene Wiggs, our last remaining charter member of Grace, passed away Friday. And I just want to give you arrangements on that. Six to eight visitation at Dave's Culbertson tonight, 11 o'clock funeral tomorrow. There will be no meal here at the church. They're going to do something otherwise at um, a granddaughter's house. But uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. You've still got time to come to the concert and then go over there for the last part of visitation. But wanted you to be aware that's the last charter member of Grace Baptist Church. So that's kind of sad. That kind of closes a, 
a chapter of history there on Grace Baptist Church. So pray for the family in their loss. Would you pray with me right now? Father God, I want to just, uh, first of all, we want to repent of our sins. God, our, our, our message today, our theme today, the worship today centers around the light and fellowship with you and uh, worshiping you. And we know that uh, before we can do that, we have got to get right with you. And God, many of us here in this room are not right with you. Maybe we're right with you, but we're not right with others. And we cannot be right with you as long as we're wrong with others. So, God, I pray that you would just sweep through this congregation today, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would convict us of those sins, that you, uh, through the Holy Spirit, would make us aware of those things in our lives that should not be there. And I pray, God, that you would send revival to our church. We desperately need revival, Lord. We've become apathetic, complacent. In some ways, we've become lazy. We've become comfortable. And God, I pray that you'd send revival to our church. I pray that you'd send revival to our homes, Lord. What we appear to be on Sundays is a lot different than what we appear to be inside the walls of our home. And I pray that you would send healing to our homes, that there would be mended relationships between husband and wife, between uh parents and children, that you would just sweep through our homes and send revival. And I pray, Lord, that you'd send revival to our personal lives. I pray, Lord, that we would get right with you. We would get on the path walking with you, beside you, being on mission with you and doing that which you've called us to do, God. I know that the month of August is always our month where we promote revival. And it's going to be an exciting month. I can't wait because of all these spectacular Sundays. And I pray that the revival would begin today. It wouldn't wait till next week. And it'd start just kind of moving across this congregation. It'd move outside these doors and these walls into this city and into this county and this community. I pray, Lord, for fresh wind and fresh fire. Fall upon us. Reveal your presence to us. Show up and show out. May they truly be spectacular Sundays. May we experience spectacular Mondays, spectacular Tuesdays, spectacular Wednesdays, Wednesdays and so forth. God, we pray. We pray for a new anointing. And we pray for you just to unleash your power upon us. God, we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful, precious name. And all God's people agreed by saying, Amen. Let's take a minute to fellowship with one another. the empty claims of 
heard upon this earth. All right, let me, well, let's just start it over again. Here we go. <laughs> Get everybody in. Here we go. Let's find, find it. Here we go. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me. Stand in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your cross testifies in grace, tis of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Not only we approach not earthly confidence, it's only by your love. What can wash away? with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Close down and come. 
Thank you for the grace that was exemplified on the cross, the grace of your precious blood shed for us that covers all our sins, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that, uh, that salvation is by grace alone, not that we can boast about anything at all that we can do to receive grace. It is only by your, your blood and your shed blood, your, your atonement on the cross for us that we can be saved, Lord. Thank you. Uh, we uh, thank you that we have the privilege of walking in the light of your word in fellowship with one another and in fellowship with you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your amazing grace, grace that will not ever let go of us. In Christ's name we pray.
Thank you, choir. I'm excited about uh, the resurrection of our Wednesday night meals, and I hope that you are as well. hope that you'll sign up, give them a try. They kind of uh, got down to a, a very bare minimum number of people coming, and uh, we shut them down not only because we didn't have a food coordinator, but because of the lack of attendance. So I'm excited about that. And then uh, we have wonderful activities on Wednesday nights. I'm going to be preaching about uh, God's uh, return, Jesus' second coming this Wednesday night. So that might be of interest to you. We've got activities for the youth and children and preschoolers as well. So if that is of interest, uh, I hope that you'll be a part of our Wednesday night activities. Bill died leaving a will that... Um, provided $30,000 for an elaborate funeral. As the last of the visitors filed out of the funeral home, Lynn's best friend Sue came over to Lynn and she said that was an absolutely wonderful funeral. I think Bill would have been pleased. If you don't mind me asking, how much did that funeral cost? And Lynn said $30,000. She said, $30,000? She said, yes, $7,000 for the service. I gave $500 to the minister, and the other was used for a stone. Quickly computing in her head, she said, you spent $22,500 for a stone? She said, my goodness, how big is it? She said, two and a half carats. If you would, take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to 1 John. When you find 1 John, say amen. amen. There are two important relationships for a Christian. First of all, there is sonship. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. There is sonship. There is that time that we receive Jesus Christ and become a child of God. But then there is also fellowship. And fellowship is something that we have to work on. And fellowship with God uh, every day is the way we ought to be walking and the way we ought to be living. And these verses today tell us how we can have fellowship with God. God, would you listen as I read verses 5, 6, and 7? This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we repent of our sins by faith, trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and confess with our mouth, we become a child of God. That is eternal. That is never to be broken. The Bible says no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. But fellowship with God is conditional. Something can creep into our lives and break that fellowship with God. Maybe a habit, maybe a sin, maybe a possession, maybe another priority. And that can creep into our lives and slowly but surely it will separate us from God. And so these verses this morning tell us how to have fellowship with God. Let's first of all think about how fellowship with God is made. Look at the last part of verse 5. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, that, those verses tell us how fellowship with God is made. You see, if we want to walk with, in fellowship with God, we must first receive the light. Now, notice this statement, God is light. Everybody say that with me. God is light. The Bible says in Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In Psalm 36, 9, for with you is life's foundation. In the light we will see light. John 1, 9, the true light who gives light to everyone is coming into the world. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again and said, I am the light of the world. 
John 12, 36, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in the darkness. God is light and God comes, has come into this world as the light of the world in and through his son Jesus Christ. And when it says God is light, that means several things. It means, first of all, physically that God is light. The Bible says several times that the glory of the Lord shone round about them, that God's light is shining brightly. The Bible says that in reference to light, that the knowledge of God. You see, God knows all about us. God knows all of our hidden secrets. God knows everything about us. And then also, it means morally that God is holy and pure. In Him there is no darkness. There is no hint of sin. There is no hint of moral imperfection with God. God. And, the, and the, so it says that the Bible says in James 1.17 that God is the Father of lights. So when we come to the Lord, we come to the light. We're walking in darkness, but we come to the light. The Bible says before we were saved, we were in darkness. But God has called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. The scriptures also say you were sometimes in darkness, now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light. So to become to have fellowship with God, we must first receive the light. Secondly, we must reject the darkness. Notice verse 5. In him there is no darkness at all. Now, sometimes in the Greek language, they use double negatives for effect. Using double negatives in English is a no-no, but they did it in Greek. And so literally what this verse is saying is God is light, and in Him there is not no darkness. Now, that, that, uh, that is poor grammar, but that is excellent theology, okay? In him there is not no darkness. That means that there is not the slightest hint of sin or moral imperfection in God. And folks, that's why when Jesus came into this world, this world got mad. They didn't like the light of the world. When Jesus came into this world, they rejected him. And they, when Jesus came into this world and turned on the light, they saw their sins. They saw themselves as they were. And the Bible says uh, that and the condemnation came upon them when the light came into the world because the men loved darkness rather than light because their e de deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. You see, if you think about it, most crimes happen at night most people get drunk at night most people have more uh, moral uh, affairs and and immorality it happens after dark because the Bible says that light exposes people's sin and you see Jesus the light came into this world and he they did the world didn't like the light the world was in engulfed in darkness. They were in total sin. But Jesus came into this world and he flipped on the light. And they didn't like it. And so they decided they would extinguish the light. So the Bible says that they took the light and they nailed him to an old rugged cross on the hill of Calvary. And they placed that light in a tomb after the light went out. And they rolled a stone in front of that tomb. But praise God on Easter Sunday morning the light began to shine again. And the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, came up from the dead hallelujah God is light and in him there is no darkness so if you want to walk with God you've got to first receive the light secondly you've got to reject the darkness now let's talk about how fellowship with God is marred verse 6 tells us how a person can be out of fellowship with God and still professing to be in fellowship with God. Now we know that to be called hypocritical, right? Some of you in this room, this describes your relationship with God. Notice these first three words in verse 6. If we say. Now that is a profession. Let me just remind you, it is a huge claim to profess to be a Christian. It is a 
a, a claim of magnitude to say that we are walking in fellowship with God. That is not something to be taken lightly, friends. When you say that you're in fellowship with God, that means you have trusted God's Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. It means that you are interested in the same things that God is interested in. It means that you are walking in daily obedience with God. It means you are going in the same direction with God. It means that your mind is on spiritual things, not on earthly things. It is not something to be taken lightly. And so it says, if we say we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness. There's the pretense. Many claim to have fellowship with God, but yet they're walking in darkness. They are not at all living what they profess. There were several heresies going on with the time that John wrote this particular epistle. One of those heresies that was being taught was that a person can live in known sin and still be right with God. There were those who were excusing a sinful lifestyle on the basis, basis of a relationship with God. And they were claiming that freedom in Christ meant that they could live and do and sin as they please. I don't know about you, but that's still the philosophy of our world today. Now, I, I don't know how many of you watch The Bachelorette. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I've gotten caught up in this season. But God, it was woman that made me do it. <laughs> Can't help it. I walk in the room, it's on, and there's no other way I can watch anything else. No. But Hannah the Bachelorette is one of those people that I'm speaking of. She claims to be a Christian. She talks about this faith with God, but then she cusses like a sailor and acts like a harlot. I want to tell you folks that Hannah is not the only one. There are many people today who claim to have fellowship with God, and yet they are walking in darkness. I want you to understand profession does not mean possession. It is not enough to talk the talk. You must walk the walk. Jesus says, there will be many who will claim me. Who will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons? Have we not prophesied and preached in your name and done all these special things? And the Lord will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. You say, preacher, how do I know if I'm having, if I'm walking in fellowship with God? How do I know that I'm, I'm walking step in step with God? How do I know that I'm, I'm on the same path with God? Well, the first thing you do is you take a look at your life. You take a look at your priorities. You take a look at where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money. You, you take a look at your talk and the way you act and you, the way you react. You look at your attitude. Just do a self-examination. And that will tell you if you're walking in the light or if you're walking in darkness. I want you to notice what John says. He said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. In other words, these are some strong words. It says, if you're a Christian and you're living in known sin, God says you're a liar. The tragedy of the modern church today is that we have too many people who claim to know Jesus and yet their life is filled with sin. They're walking in darkness. I want you to understand that when we live in known sin, we do not confess our sins. Now, none of us are perfect. We can't be sinless, but we can learn to sin less. Amen? When we're walking in known sin, it not only misrepresents the Lord Jesus Christ, but it misdirects the lost. And what I mean by that, it hinders people from getting saved. Do you want to be the reason somebody goes to hell? I don't think so. I read a story about a lighthouse, and the keeper of the lighthouse discovered one day that the glass, one of the glasses in the lighthouse uh, was broken out. The wind had evidently blown it out there, and the keeper of the lighthouse didn't have any more glass at, on hand there, so he just put a piece of tin in that pane there just to fill it for a little while temporarily. Well, little did he know that, that on that water that night on the ocean that night there was a ship 
that was trying to make its way to the shore. And it was a very stormy night. And the very dark spot where the tin was covering the light was where the ship needed to find direction to get safety. And the ship was wrecked because there was a dark spot in the lighthouse. I want you to ask, I want to ask you something, friend. Is there a dark spot in your life? Is there a habit that's misleading unsaved people? Is there a sorry attitude, an ugly disposition that contradicts everything that you say that you are that is leading someone astray? We ought not have any dark spot in our life. That would hinder someone from coming to Christ. Amen. Finally, let me share with you how fellowship with God is maintained. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, how, how do we keep walking with God? You say, well, do we come, does that mean we have to come to church every time the doors open? That's a good way to keep walking with God, yes. Do, does it mean that we have to volunteer for everything that uh, the church does? I mean, that, that's certainly nothing wrong with that. Does that mean we have to put X amount of dollars in the offering plate? There's nothing wrong with that. But what it means to walk with God means that you've got to be in daily communication with God and be following Him in daily obedience. You say, well, how do we do that, preacher? Well, first thing you do is you got to read God's Word. How are you going to learn which way God's going? How are you going to learn what, what God likes and dislikes if you don't read His Word? The Bible says that His Word is a lamp unto our, our, our past and a light unto our past there. How are we going to learn who, who God is and what God wants us to do if we don't read His Word? And then how are we going to get guidance if we don't pray? How are you going to get along with your wife your husband your kids if you don't talk to them how are you going to get along with your work associates if you don't talk how are you going to get along with God if you don't talk to him and listen to him if you don't get in touch with God at the start of the day you'll be out of touch with him the rest of the day and so we need to start every day with a quiet time with God by reading God's Word and by praying to God, by talking to God. And when God reveals to us something in His Word or reveals to us something to us in our prayer time, He tells us to do, then we need to do it. We don't need to argue with Him. We don't need to hesitate. We don't need to procrastinate. We don't need to make excuses. We need to do whatever He tells us to do. And the Bible says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That means to go to church. That the Bible tells us to win souls. That means we need to do what God tells us to do. The Bible says to give and to serve and to, to be faithful. We need to do all those things as God reveals these things to us. We are daily walking in obedience and in fellowship with Him. You say, well, preacher, but I'm not perfect. I sin. I mess up. What do I do when I have those mishaps? What do I do when I sin? Well, notice what verse 7 says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The precious blood of Jesus was God Himself's royal blood flowing through the veins of His Son. And when those nails were driven into His hands and feet at Calvary, and when that sword was thrust into His side, and that precious blood was pouring out on the ground, do you know what God was doing? He was making atonement for our sins. The Bible says in Revelation 1, 5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood. That's the initial cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Today, some of you have never received that initial cleansing. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary is still pertinent today. It is still relevant today. It is still applicable today. It is... It is it is that opportunity for you to receive that initial cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. He died in your place. He died in my place. But you say, preacher, what about those sins that I commit after I'm saved? Well, we've already established the fact that none of us are perfect, that we sometimes have good days, we sometimes have bad days, we lose our temper sometimes, we say things we shouldn't say, we react ways that we shouldn't react, we fail to do things that we should be doing, we do, do things that we shouldn't be doing. What about those times when we get out of fellowship with God and we mess up? Well, if you'll notice, this verse says, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us. Notice that. Church, notice. It cleanses us. doesn't say cleansed. 
It says cleanses us, present tense. That means if we confess our sins daily to God, the precious blood of Jesus Christ just keeps on washing those sins away. Hallelujah. In 1941, Noble Doss dropped the ball and it taunted him ever since. I cost us a national championship, he says. The University of Texas football team was ranked number one in the nation. Hoping for an undefeated season and a berth in the Rose Bowl, they played conference rival Baylor University. With a 7 to nothing lead in the third quarter, the Longhorn quarterback launched a deep pass to a wide-open Doss in the end zone. The throw was right on target, but the sure-handed Doss dropped the ball. Baylor rallied to score with just seconds to play. The game ended in a tie. Texas lost their top ranking and consequently their chance to play in the Rose Bowl. I think about that play every day. That drop pass still haunts me, Doss admits. The fans don't remember all the passes I caught. All they remember is the one I missed. With that one mistake, I disappointed people. I let my team down and we came up short. Brothers and sisters, if only we had dropped a pass. If only we had merely disappointed a football squad. But you see, when we sin, we let others down. We misrepresent the Lord. We misdirect the lost. But most of all, we disappoint God. Every time we sin, there's another nail driven into the precious hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Years ago, John Wesley was returning home from a revival service one night when all of a sudden, out of the darkness, a robber appears. The robber threatens Wesley, and Wesley gives him what little money and literature, Christian literature he has on him, and the bandit was leaving. Wesley called out, Stop! I have something more valuable to give you. The robber stopped in interest and Wesley said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And with that, the thief hurried away into the darkness. Years later, Wesley was greeting people after a Sunday morning service when he was approached by a stranger. What a surprise to learn that the visitor, now a believer in Christ, confessed that he was the one who had robbed Wesley years before. Thank you, said the transformed man, for telling me about the precious blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Dear hearts, let me remind you there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I want to invite you to come today confessing your sins and asking the Lord to forgive you and cleanse you from all sin unrighteousness would you bow with me as we pray father god thank you so much for what you have done for us and not only what you have done for us but what you continue to do for us thank you lord that if we come confessing our sins you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness thank you lord for the opportunity to get right with you Thank you every day that it's a new day and that your love and your mercies are new. And they're always constant. They're always unconditional. You tell us to come to you and you're always ready to receive us. The song that we're about to sing says, Oh, come to the altar. Your altar is always open. It's not just open on Sundays from, for 10 minutes. It's open all the time. Your arms are open wide. And you gladly receive us, those of us who are willing to come. If there's anyone here today, Lord, that needs to be saved, needs to be baptized, needs to rededicate their life, needs to join the church, whatever it may be, I pray, Lord, that they will come as this altar is open and as your arms are open wide to receive them. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Father, we love you and we, we thank you and we give you all praise. But Father, we, we just want to thank you for your creation, Father, for your word, for our salvation, and mostly for your presence. And so, Father, I want to pray for each heart that is here, Father, that we would empty ourselves of our sin and, Father, receive you, that we know you better. Father, as we come to this time where we prepare to give back to you a portion that you've given to us, I pray that you will use it for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Here's a little preview of the tonight's uh, trademark concert.
There's a little boy sitting on a bench at a little league baseball game. He throws a pretty good curve, but nobody in the crowd even knows his name. Just 14 summers from now, he'll be pitching for the Mets. He just don't know it yet. There's a single mom just barely getting by on waitress pay. There's a fireman that buys his morning cup of coffee there every day. He just bought a diamond ring. She's gonna say yes. She just don't know it yet. Never underestimate the power of a heart committed to never giving up. Anything is possible and all it takes. There's a young couple that's been trying real hard not to give up hope. And as of just last week, six different doctors have told them no. Oh, but nine months from today, they'll be rocking little baby bed. They just don't know. If you're standing at the bottom of a mountain and you're looking up at the top, oh, whatever you do, just keep on giving it all you got. Cause those dreams you're reaching for are waiting just up ahead. You just don't know. We're going to have a good time today and tonight. Uh, those of you that signed up to help us with back re uh, Backpack Outreach, I hope that uh, you got word that we're going to meet at 3.30 just to cover our bases, just to find out who's doing what. And it starts at 4. We get through at 6, but we don't want you to go home then because we're having a concert right here next door. And our hopes were two twofold in this. One, to get some of those folks that we're reaching out to with the backpacks to stay and come to a comfortable setting for a, a relaxed evening, evening worshiping the Lord through this concert. Two, to get you in the habit and then the mode of coming on Sunday nights again because we've had the summer off. And that will get you fired up and ready for our spectacular Sundays, which start one week from tonight. Bartholomew Orr is going to be our preacher. He is a ball of fire. And you will certainly enjoy him. I, I, I contacted Mount Zion. They're going to come over. And, of course, First Baptist is going to be here. And all of our people, we're going to have a great crowd. Tom Smart and the First Baptist Choir is going to combine with our choir. It's going to be a great first night of the spectacular Sundays. It's going to be the first of four. So we're going to have a great time. So please come back, support the concert tonight. Check your calendar, prioritize it, be a part of our spectacular Sunday nights. Miss Robin has something to say about the trivia night before we close. Just very quickly, 
Um, we don't want to beat anybody over the head with the building fund team all the time, but we have a trivia night planned for August 10th at 6 p.m. It's a dinner and the trivia game. You don't have to play the game. You can come and eat. At, we will have a silent auction. I want to tell you we've got some really good donations so far, and we will have door prizes as well. Um, I just want to tell you one thing, one piece of trivia. 155 days left in the year. There's 155 days left in 2019. So after that is going to be 2020. Our goal has always been to have this church paid in full by 2020 because it saves us a ton of money and interest. So just pray about that. Think about it. Please come. This will be a night of fellowship. It doesn't matter if you know anything or not. Trivia is trivia. And uh, if you're good at it, that just means you don't know much of anything. So come on down. Have a good time with us. You'll be glad you did. Everything that we make is going toward the building fund, and it's just one more way we're trying to help this church pay off the debt. Thank you. Oh, and I'm at the welcome desk selling tickets. We sure are. Uh, thank you so much. Hey, and... Uh... Pastor Tim and, and Randy Edwards will be in the hallway right out here if you want to take a chance. To, uh, take a chance. Yeah, take a, <laughs> it is a chance. Take a second to say hello to them if you're our guest. If you, um, they've got a gift for you. If you have any questions, you can ask them, okay? Hey, and listen, this afternoon when, when y'all come work the backpack outreach, be sure to invite the, the people that are here for the backpacks to come to the concert because that's not a given. Uh, we just need to encourage them to stick around, okay? All right. Speaking of stick, sticking around, stay around just a minute and say hello to about two dozen people, okay? All right. Thank you. <laughs> 